What's up, YouTube? It's the homie Joshua. Welcome to the homie hangout where we help others move in excellence through me talking about my experiences in prison and jails. And then also other subjects like the law, mental health, and, and a variety of topics. So today I'm going to talk about my time in Pelican Bay in the SU program. I was validated as a Northern Structure slash Nuestra Raza prison gang member. I went to the Corcoran SU for about seven months. I did a video on that if you want to catch up. And then I was transferred to Pelican Bay SU program where I stayed until I paroled in December of 2005. My entire time there, I was in an area called C3, right? And so I'll pull up there. Other people have talked about the dynamics of the bay and the layout and everything. So I won't get too much into that, but I will just say there's, there's eight cells in a section plus a shower on the top tier and the bottom tier. There's a little yard for everybody in that section to go to. You go out there one at a time, one cell at a time. And that's about it, right? It's, it's you're kind of closed off. And so I get put in my cell and somebody gets at me in a vent, my neighbor, and they say, hey, are you a camarada? Which I understood to be language that, that Southerners and Sueños use to refer to one another. And so I said, nah, Norteño. And they were like, okay. And they said, look, you, you got a homeboy downstairs, but really most of your homeboys are in another section and we got some people over there. So when we come out, I'll go get at them and, and let them know that you're here. And in the meantime, I got, you know, we got a care package for you, right? And he introduced himself as Danny Boy from Hazard. And he had a celly named Jaco Padilla, I believe, uh, from Azusa. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, good looking out. And it was a little odd. That was my first time talking to uh, alleged MA members. And so, and there was a handful in that section. They were definitely the majority. And, and some of the names uh, might be familiar to people who, who have studied MA history or, or different cases. Um, but so anyways, I had Danny Boy from Hazard and Jaco Padilla from, from Azusa that live right next door. Jaco wound up moving at some point. They weren't Sally's anymore. Uh, Manuel Zarate from San Diego was next to them. And then uh, who was it? Uh, Cricket, right from Pico Rivera was over there. And so then on the bottom, right below me, I had Cyclone Gallegos from Santa Monica. He was set up with Boxer Caja from the Avenues, uh, Tolento. And then next door to them was Tortuga from Colton, right, Mark Quiros. And next to him was a homeboy from Milpitas. I don't know if he was a, uh, he was a sympathizer, right? We'll put it that way. And, and I don't remember who was in that last cell uh, for some reason. But anyways, uh, and Caja wound up getting moved throughout my time there. So, so him and, and Cyclone weren't cellies anymore. They had a habit of coming in in the middle of the night and, and snatching people up, right? And, and there's all kinds of rumors around what happens. They get hoods put on them and put on helicopters. I don't know the truth of any of that. I don't have anything bad to say about those guys. You know, they rode in a different lane. That lane's not my business. Um, I've heard some different things about them. Uh, I believe Jacko uh, is deceased now. And, and I think Kaha left the fold, but but that stuff, again, is not my lane, right? But I did have interactions with all these individuals and they were positive interactions. So Danny Boy comes out and he gives me this care package and that's a good care package, right? It's soups, there's paper, there's envelopes, there's a pen, there's some coffee, all kinds of stuff. Uh, no contraband, there's a couple books, there's a couple magazines, there's a newspaper. <laughs> I mean, it is a good, a good care package. And I was a little hesitant accepting it. Again, I had been given a rundown by Carlitos and so in Corcoran. And so a lot of the rumors and stuff that you hear about the Bay, you know, he had already cleared that stuff up for me. I knew about the door policy, which meant that when the doors open with, with MA folks or MA associates at least, then we don't take action, they don't take action. You, you take a defensive position at your cell. And obviously if there's a threat, then you handle it. But otherwise you're, you're just defending yourself. You're not being the aggressor. 
I was never put in a position where my door popped at the same time as everybody else. There was a situation where Cricket's door popped from Biko and the homeboy downstairs from Milpitas' door popped and there was no conflict, right? They they just stood outside their cells and, and Cricket wound up in fact going back inside his cell. And so that was it. And so when Danny Boy comes out, he's got a big black hand and MA tattooed on his chest. And that was my first time seeing an MA member. Um, there was one in Corcoran, but I didn't have any interactions with him and, and he was a lot older. But it was the first time like I had an MA do that myself. And you gotta keep in mind at that time, that's way before into hostilities or any of that stuff. And so they weren't on the yard, right? Um, none of the, the players for the big four were really in the general population, at least not in my experience. And so it's kind of a trip, man, because, you know, you hear about these guys and, and they're the arch rivals, and they're the height of the opposition. But the Bay is, for the most part, a very respectful environment. And so, uh, like I said, the care package was, was great. And, and I accepted it because I had been schooled that, that, you know, we accept those things and, and we would do the same in return. And sure enough, I had watched them go downstairs and, and fish out the door to our section, to some other section and, and alert those folks to my presence. And so, and I was a bro, but I mean, I was no significant figure. And so I was like, man, it's cool. I say, hey, when I get my property, then, you know, I'll shoot this stuff back. And he's like, no, nah, don't worry about it because somewhere there's one of your homeboys that's, that's looking out for one of mine uh, because, you know, we don't have other people there. So it all washes out in the end, man. I'm not tripping. If you could just shoot me back the magazine because that hasn't made it all the way around. But otherwise, Holmes, that's on you, right? And so I appreciate it. I was like, man, good looking out. And so I wind up getting word you know, the northerner, the guy downstairs uh, comes up to the cell and, and I think he was at Hermano um, or an Hermano associate. He he was a good dude, right? I don't want to get into a lot of details about him. Uh, he was a good guy. He was in good standing. He took meds. Um, he took some hot meds at night. And, and so while he was sharp in one way, he was also, you know, just kind of not always fully alert and present let's say but a good guy right so he winds up receiving word from from the other section and I you know I get the questionnaire blah 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 I fill it out you know, you know where I was who I was with the whole nine yards and and shoot it back and so in the coming days uh, within the next couple of days I'm having these conversations with this with this northerner from downstairs He's coming up by my cell and hanging out a little bit. I go down towards his cell and hang out a little bit. And so we're talking and he's telling me and we're communicating on paper as well. And he's telling me, I don't get any packages. Sorry, I can't shoot your care package, homie. I really don't have anything. And the way I was schooled and the way I was brought up, that's, that's not acceptable, right? It's not acceptable to have homeboys that are going without if there's any way to provide for them. And so I didn't like that idea and I wasn't casting judgment on the rest of the household. I didn't even know those guys, but I didn't like the idea that this person was struggling and didn't have the resources that they needed. And courtesy of my time in Corcoran, I was schooled on various ways to bring in contraband to the Bay and ways to make money, right? I was, I was prepared for all of that. And so, I shared some of that with this guy and perhaps I jumped the gun in, in sharing with him, um, you know, so soon, but, but obviously he was cleared. Obviously he was communicating with folks. The section was not the, the dropout section, which was, I think D 12 or, or somewhere over there. So, so I made an assumption that, that he was in good standing and, and whatnot. So, and he had been in that section for a long time. So I said, look, homie, you don't get packages. He didn't go to canteen. He didn't have any real mail coming in from the streets very infrequently. And I had people in the streets that would look out for me in various ways, including, uh, you know, hypothetically helping me to bring in contraband 
in these discrete ways that more often than not at the time were successful. And so my thought was we can bring in this contraband and make some money and you know the homeboy get packages, that kind of stuff. And, and that way he could make a little money as well. And obviously contribute to the household and, and everything else, right? I wasn't trying to be greedy, far from it. And I didn't necessarily need to, to get contraband brought in to be able to provide for myself, but I didn't get enough to be able to fully provide for him. And so we had to find some other way to do that. And clearly he wasn't getting the resources from other folks in the section for whatever reason. And I didn't know what that reason and I didn't ask. Uh, I was just there, it wasn't my business. So I have this whole conversation with him. Well, he goes and basically gets at the fellas elsewhere in that section and says, hey, you know, Rascal says we can do this and we can do that and blah, blah, blah. And, and I don't know exactly what he told him, but clearly he gave him some kind of rundown on what I was proposing. And I had stressed to him that everything would run through the household, right? Like we'd have to get everything cleared. But I assumed, I told him, I don't think it'll be an issue because this is what we do for each other, right? I'm, I'm not presenting some radical idea. This is how we look out for each other. And that's the way that I was schooled in general. And, and in particular, the way that I was brought up with my celly and Corcoran preparing me to go to the bank. And, and that's, I don't want to get into the contraband part, but in terms of hustling and providing for the folks in Corcoran, that's what he did. He was very big on that. And we would go without for the sake of, of the Northerners, the Hermanos, the, you know, whoever else was there that they were cared for. And we didn't really go without, but, but we would have. So I get a kite back from an individual named Peanut from Stockton, Charles Oak. And generally, I don't really talk about folks, right? Um, but in his case, I will, A, because he's dead, and B, because he was a jerk and, and is indicative of the type of C that, that I was not in favor of, and that kind of turned me off from participating with the organization. Again, not that I was invited to, but at one point in time, those were my aspirations, not for the power, but for the schooling and the knowledge and the influence. So he shoots me this long kite, telling me, how dare you? You're not even cleared. You're out of bounds even having this conversation, blah, 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 blah. So I respond. And, and I'm a little bit hard-headed in the sense of, if you're gonna say something to me, man, you gotta make it make sense, right? And, and if you're gonna say that I'm wrong, you need to show me where I'm wrong and show me what's right. So I'm not saying that I'm never wrong, but this idea of because I said so, uh, unless it's in terms of, of, you know, a pegada or something like that, you know, where it's privileged information, I don't need to know, I just need to do what I'm told. But in terms of this kind of stuff, okay, well, make it make sense to me. And, and that's just the way that I was. And it got me in trouble sometimes. If you look at my San Quentin video, it got me in trouble in San Quentin. Um, it got me, it didn't get me in trouble in Corcoran, but it led to my, my first celly over there who was uh, kind of not really taking a liking to me. And so this was my routine throughout prison. And so I replied to Peanut. And I'm like, hey, homie, I, there must be some kind of misunderstanding. I was never suggesting to not include the household. I'm not trying to operate outside the bounds of, of the rules and regulations in this place. I have not put in motion any of this. I was simply having a conversation with the homie about the potential for trying to provide for him. Because my understanding, and I referenced my previous Sally and Corcoran, is that you know, that these things are possible and are acceptable and that we need to look out for each other. And I'm in a position to be able to help look out for the homie, but it, only in this fashion. So he writes me back. I didn't ask for a response. Um, don't mention hermanos or the NR to me, they're dead. Uh, how dare you? And uh, because I put in my original uh, response to the questionnaire that, that I was a hermano, right? And, and that was the language that I kept using, and even though they had been disbanded. But I, I stayed with that language. It was 
fairly new, not entirely new, but but it was in the early years of that kind of being adapted everywhere. And even when I was in corporate amongst C's, they used that language. So I didn't see anything wrong with it. I wasn't trying to be offensive. And so he was all pissed off about that. And I didn't ask for a response, blah, blah, blah. You know, don't you know who I am? I'm Pina from Stockton, Nuestra Familia member. I'm running this section, blah, 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 blah. Thumping his chest, man. And I didn't like his tone. And I didn't, I didn't like how he was coming at me. I felt it was uncalled for. But in my mind, I'm like, man, he's a C. So he has to be sharp, right? Because he can't be dumb and become a mobster. So clearly, I'm not conveying something properly in these communications. Because he seems to be really upset. And I don't have any idea what I've done to offend him. And so, and he hasn't made clear what I've done wrong. The stuff that he said initially I did wrong, I didn't actually do. So I sued him back another guy. And my only response that I got from that one is, if I want, if you ever reach out to me unsolicited again, that will be the end of your career. And that was it. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not that stubborn. So I backed up and, and I didn't communicate with them anymore. And all of these communications were coming through the dude downstairs. And so he was seeing all this as well. And he was like, man, I don't know what's going on, this and that, but I don't know why you keep responding, homie. Like, you're going to get yourself in trouble. I'm like, what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. And, and so I didn't have a whole lot of contact with the homies from that point. I was still in good standing, right? I was still on roll call. I would get little filters. Every now and then they'd shoot a, you know, a topic for schooling. And, and so I would kind of, you know, take charge of that with, with homeboy downstairs. But there wasn't a great degree of communication. I'd go to the law library and, and there were some folks that were, that were in my block, but in another section, I would talk to them. And, and when I took the Blackstone paralegal course, you know, homeboy kind of put me up on game on how to do that. And, and so I had good relationships with people uh, but they were far and few between and they weren't politics, right? They weren't household business, so to speak. And, and so it was not what I had expected. And I had been warned in Corkland, it's not what you think it is up there. It's not what you're looking for. And, and they were right. It wasn't. So I stayed up down there for years. Um, I played chess with, with my neighbors. Uh, I was doing a lot of legal work. I was fighting uh, the homeboy downstairs as validation. He didn't have very solid um, information, right? He, he only had three points and, and they weren't real good. And one of them was that he had a Welder bird tattoo. But his neighbor, Tortuga from Colton, who has a reputation, um, he also has a Welder bird tattooed on him. And it looks the same as, as the homeboys, right? So I get at him and I'm like, look, can I use you, but by name, can I use you in this appeal for his validation? Because they're saying that his Welga bird shows allegiance to the NF. However, you're validated and doing a life sentence and then some for allegedly being an MA member, and yet you have the same tattoo. So if you could be a mafioso with that tattoo, then that suggests it's not exclusive to mobsters, right? And he was like, yeah, I'm not tripping, go ahead. Right, he didn't care. And, and it was about fighting the system. Um, and so, so it was cool. I got along good with, with all the, the mafiosos or alleged mafiosos in the building. And, and they, were, they were respectful people, right? We would exchange books when Blackstone Paralegal, I mean, when um, Coastline Community College, when they first made college classes available to us in prison. And it was very select few. It was through correspondence, obviously. And so you couldn't get a degree or anything at that time because they didn't offer you enough of those classes but they offered some. And so a lot of us jumped on it. 
And I would take some classes one semester while other folks uh, would take other classes and then we would trade books, right, for the next semester. So next semester I'd take the class they just took and they'd shoot me their textbooks because we had to pay for all that stuff. You know, there was no, we didn't get no financial aid. We got a fee waiver for the, for the tuition, but everything else we had to pay for. And so they'd buy some books, I'd buy some books, we'd swap them out. We had cordial relations. I wouldn't call them friends because the affiliations were still in place, clearly. But, but there wasn't hostilities. But you also have to understand that I don't have a history of combat with those guys, right? I had never seen one until I got there. And so I know some of them have shed the blood of, of the folks that were considered my big homies and vice versa. But I wasn't around in that era, which, which didn't make me dismiss them as a, as a threat or make it where I'd get all cozy with them. But it wasn't personal, right? I, I didn't have a personal beef with them. I had a cultural beef with them in the sense of, of how I grew up and who I ran with, but I had never had a, a foul personal interaction with them. And I think that influenced how I dealt with them because I've talked to some other people who have had interactions with them and have had hostile interactions with them. And a lot of their views are like, nah, bro, no way, never, right? I don't, I don't trust them, but again, it's personal. It's kind of like gang banging in the streets, right? You could ride for your neighborhood and get all dressed up in your costume and all that other stuff. But when somebody kills your homeboy, when you get smashed in the alleyway and hit upside the head with a bat, when you get stabbed and sent to the hospital, all of a sudden that gang banging becomes real, right? Because this opposition is not just the opposition because they live somewhere else or they rep something else or they dress different or they like different numbers. They're in opposition because they have injured you or someone you care about. So it's personal now. And I understand that. And it happens on both sides. It's not unique to the North or the South. It's not unique to Harasa. Like that's, I think, the truth for everybody. I didn't have that personal issue with them. And so cricket, I know it's been joked about on other channels, but um, you know, you do burpees, you do exercise routines, but you get tired of doing the same stuff over and over. But you have to work to keep your body in shape. And Cricket from Pico Rivera was real into yoga. He was a good sized guy. And he was into yoga. And I would laugh it off, right? Because I'm thinking of, of this feminine thing. And he's like, nah, if we look, I'm going to shoot you some, some exercises, some routines. And this stuff will work muscles you didn't even know you had. And, and it's a good little switch up from the traditional burpees and block jumps and squats and rolling up your mattress and your legal work and, and all that. And sure enough, it, it was true. And, and your body gets kind of stiff in there. You know, you don't get to move around a whole lot. When you go to the yard, you just walk laps for the most part. And so, so you do get kind of stiff and, and it's cold. And so that stuff was cool. And, and I actually got down with, with some of it. And, He's going to put me up on, on switching your diet to a Buddhist diet, you know, switching your belief thing, which I wasn't listed as having any religious beliefs. But the food there was slim portions. And at the time I was there, if you got a vegetarian diet, that means you got at least double of everything, except you didn't get meat. But you got double portions of everything else. And even if the, the meal, like if you got peanut butter sandwiches that day, you still get double, even though there's no meat to take away. And so I was like, bro, how are you getting these big ass trays, right? I didn't call him bro, but you know, man, how are you getting these big old trays? And he's like, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and he wasn't a Buddhist, but I was like, I'm gonna get on that hustle. And so I was like, hey, you know, filled out a little thing and said, I'm, I'm a Buddhist. And I don't eat meat, I'm a vegetarian. And so I need my diet adjusted. And they did. And, and then they started cutting back. I think they realized the hustle and, and all of a sudden, you know, tons of these quote unquote prison gang members and killers 
are all of a sudden turned into this pacifist belief system. And, and I think they realized something's up here. And probably somebody dropped out and, and gave up the game and stuff anyway. So, yeah, so they cut that back. And then I went back to the meat diet because we weren't really getting much extra at all. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, I had a range of experiences up there. Uh, for those who haven't checked out the Working X Cons channel, it's a good channel. And, and as Biggie, I know him as Goose. Uh, and we, he was in the section next to me. So we would talk pretty frequently when we were brought to yard at the same time. And, and there was even respect on that, right? If, if you went to the yard and you wanted to talk to a specific person in the, in the section next to you, then you could let whoever was on that yard know, hey, um, you know, I'm trying to see so-and-so, man. And they would give up their yard time or, or switch their yard routine, right? Like, hey, man, I'm not ready to go out right now. Why don't you get the next guy? And I'll go out after him to allow people to get back there and talk. And so, again, the respect level was, was high. And that, that was my time. You know, that was my time in the Bay. It, it wasn't particularly exciting. Um, but I became disillusioned. And, and so I didn't drop out. I, I didn't debrief. I didn't none of that stuff. But I lost some of that fire to to be a part and the education really helped me in a sense of you know the, the actual education the college education because i was getting straight a's and i remember the first i got a slip that was like hey you're on the president's list and i was joking but i was like does that mean i get a pardon and they were like no the president in the college right and so i but i realized i had a quality i had a skill set that could apply in society could be valuable in society. And so that gave me a little spark of hope. And, and towards the end of my time, after I had already declined the, the offer to go uh, function with a regiment in the streets, um, my mom had sent me a Bible, right? I was kind of out of stuff to read, to be honest. And she had sent me one in Corcoran, uh, but I sent it back. My mom was, you know, on drugs, everything else. She was wild and she wound up getting saved. And, you know, it was kind of, hey, man, you need to check this out and blah, blah, blah. But so she sent me one in Corcoran and I sent it back to her because you're limited on the amount of books you could have. And me and my cell, you already had a lot of books. And so I would have had to trade one of the books for that one. And I was like, I'm cool. What am I going to do with this? And so I sought it back. Um, the only thing I would have used it for is, is to roll tobacco with the pages because the pages are real thin. And we didn't really have that much tobacco. So I wasn't smoking. I had one cigarette there. So it didn't matter. But so sitting in the Bay, I'm like, man, what you, you know, suit that. And, and I followed politics on TV. And so there was a lot of, of conversation in that time about, you know, faith and whatnot and, and all these different perspectives of conservatives and, and liberals and all. And I'm like, how can so many people read the same book and have wildly different views? And, and so that's the space I stepped into it in. And, and I was pretty close to coming home and I had nothing else to do, you know? So I started reading that. I started at page one. I didn't know about all the books and chapters and stuff. And it became an intriguing story for me. And, and part of what I got from that was, and I'm not going to turn this into a big religious conversation, but part of what I got from that was, you know, uh, God's trying to bless these people, the Jews. and and they're with it until another little shiny object comes along and then they dip. And he's like, man, you guys are out of pocket, right? And so, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's one part where like he splits the ground. And, and if you're standing on one side, you live to see another day. And if you're standing on the other side, that's a wrap. And that picture, that image really sat with me. And I started reflecting on all the people that I know that had died and all the people I knew that had life sentences and the people that had, you know, died at their own hand and overdoses and murdered and kids, man, teenagers. And, and some of those people were better people than me, right? Some of them were tougher than me. Some of them were smarter than me. Some of them had better families than me. Some of them had better futures than, 
than I expected for myself. And they didn't make it. And I started wondering why, right? Why am I still here? Why do I have a release date? I've whacked people. I've gotten into it with people. I've, I've done all that. Why do I still have a date? Why am I walking out? And, and so that thought was kind of stirring. And, and so between those two things, right? Realizing that maybe I have a quality that I could apply in the streets and, and it'd be socially acceptable. And then also, man, I'm getting another shot and, and I've done my time the right way. My time is coming to an end. What am I gonna do with it, right? And, and what can I do with it? And I wasn't sure, I wasn't clear on that, but at least I had the question. And, and prior to that, I really never questioned. And so I said, let me try. Let me see how this works out. If it fails, I go back to jail. I go back to prison and that's fine. I could do time standing on my head, but maybe it doesn't fail. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's how I wrapped up my time, right? I got shot down to San Quentin. The Northerners and the Blacks had just gotten off. So I was putting ad seg overflow, waiting for a couple of days to get released. And, and it was miserable. I talked about that in, in my video of, of uh, my first few days home. Like I almost went back within 48 hours, I think. And so in that video, I talk a little bit about the transition to San Quentin, man, I was miserable. I hated it. And I wasn't messing with nobody. I wasn't trying to get involved in none of the stuff. Going. I'm like, man, I'm going home. I don't care, right? And, and I'm not stepping into that big homie role. Like I'm going out to the streets and minding my business. And I'm here for a couple of days. I'm not trying to get caught up on what happened. I'm not trying to get caught up in whatever's happening. I don't care who's here. I don't care what they're doing. I'm leaving. I don't got nothing. I don't got no property. I'm good, you know? And, and so I told him who I was and where I came from, but that was it, right? I, I was done. And yeah, that's my thing. I came home December, uh, gosh, I got to check now. I believe it was December 9th, December 9th or December 5th of 2005 and uh and that was it did my three years on high risk high control parole got raided all the time they blocked off the streets was harassed constantly no violations i made it through and so and i'm you know i've ran into seas and and hermanos and other folks since i've been out and and we have good you know relationships i mean people that's you know still in that life and and that's probably a story for another video of, of you know, some of my family was caught up. And so I felt the need to kind of re-engage on, on some level to just help clear that up because they had some trash folks running stuff. And it's a whole nother story, but that's my time in the Bay, man. Um, surrounded by alleged MA members, some of them infamous in their own right. Uh, oh, to wrap up on, on Peanut. So it turns out Peanut got out he was running things in Stockton when he got out. He got out and Operation Valley Star was on him. He, he was the principal informant to kick off Operation Valley Star, but he was still functioning out there. He was still running stuff out there. He was running dope. He was calling for people to get whacked. He was doing it all while being a confidential informant in a federal indictment. And then after that, there's another indictment and he gets picked up on that one. And he goes back to the bay, right? Goes back to the shoe. He had the nerve, right? You gotta give him a little bit of credit, I, I guess, although that's hard for me to say. He went back to the bay and plugged in, right? But in the course of that second indictment, it came out that he was the source in the first indictment. He was the source in Valley Star. So once that became somewhat public information, then, you know, he locked it up and, and, and went off about his business and he wound up getting out and then they mysteriously found him shot sitting in his car. And, uh, it, it is what it is. I'm not going to get into that, but you can connect the dots if you choose to. And so it's one of the reasons I don't have a problem talking about him. He was a jerk to me and, um, and he's dead now and all that high powered talk and, and blah, blah, blah. And he flipped, right? Flipped like a pancake. And so 
it just goes to show that a lot of these more arrogant people, a lot of these more abusive people, and I'm not saying everybody, and, and sometimes there's folks that, that conduct themselves real righteously and then all of a sudden they flip. So it's not like it's a one suit fits all, but uh, a lot of those folks, man, it, it, it comes back around, right? And, and they are not all that they are cracked up to be or all that they present themselves as. So you gotta be careful. You gotta take it all with a grain of salt. That's what I learned. Take it all with a grain of salt. And, and it's rough if you're in that lifestyle because you do have to follow directions and there is a chain of command. And there are people that have authority over you. And if you question that authority, you can put your career in danger. You can put your life in danger. And that's one of the things that I'm not interested in entertaining anymore. Um, I don't, I wanted to, but, but that experience and, and the letdown sort of, I thought I was going to get this incredible schooling and, and all this other great stuff. And I don't know exactly if it's because I, I rubbed peanut the wrong way when I first got there. I don't know if it's just because my little area was kind of cut off because it's me and, and this dude downstairs. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, but, but yeah, that's my spiel. Appreciate you guys checking out the channel. If this is your first time here. If it's not your first time here, I'd appreciate it, man. Hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell so you get notifications. I drop pretty often. I do lives pretty often. Um, leave a comment, man. Tap in. Hit me on Instagram. The homie hang out on Instagram. Shoot me a DM. You know, check out a picture or something. If you don't like it, hit a thumbs down. I don't care, right? Like, like, let me know what you don't like. And I may or may not change it, but, but this is not a prison channel. I talk about prison, but I talk about a whole lot of other stuff. And, and there's something on the channel for everybody if, if you just look and pay attention. So check out my other content. And uh, you guys have a blessed day, man. Help others move in excellence and at the same time, help yourself.